The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Why do men reject the Lord Jesus Christ? Why do they do it? In Matthew chapter 4, do they reject him because he healed the sick? He heals the sick. No question about it. Still does. Don't let anybody kid you that God heals. When I pray for someone to be healed, I pray fully believing that the Almighty can heal. And I've seen him do it before. I've seen him heal holes in heart. I've seen him raise people up from the deathbed. I've seen him heal cancer. I've seen him heal heart problems. I've seen God heal. Amen. I've seen it done time and again. In Mark chapter number five, Mark chapter five and verse number one, why do men reject Christ? Mark chapter five and verse number one. And they came over to the, to the other side of the sea of the country of the Gadarenes. And then what you read here, you're fully aware of it. In verse number seven, he cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? Now it's amazing confession coming from a devil. They know who he is. Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? The spirit world knows the spirit world. It's us that are ignorant. In verse number seven, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? Did that really happen? Did this thing really say that? Because it called him the son of God. Of course it did. I believe the Bible. I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many, many speaking as one. This is another indication of the spirit world. It goes on further down and says 2,000 had come out of the man. My goodness, he had authority over the spirit world. Do men reject him for that reason? He still does, folks. I think an awful lot of problems in the church could be settled by a good dose of driving demons out, amen. I really do. I really do. Believe me. In the book of Matthew chapter number 14, Matthew chapter number 14 and verse number 16, Jesus said unto them, they need not depart. Give ye them to eat. Give them food. Give them something to eat. And of course they did. They said, we don't have money to buy food. But he took what they had. And in verse 19, he commanded the multitude to sit down, took five loaves and two fishes and fed thousands with it. Many as much if the Lord is in it, amen. Now, if you've studied much about life, if you've done much reading at all, you understand how well off, how blessed we have been. Amen, I doubt if there's anybody in this house tonight that'll go home to an empty cupboard. I suppose all of you will have somewhere to go to and you'll have something to eat when you get there. But it's not like that all over the world. So why? When you find places where they're hungry, you find places of famine, you find places where they're fighting over food, you find places they're starving to death, why? Have you ever bothered to really read why? To look into it. Have you ever noticed how that a country that exalts the Lord Jesus Christ lifts him up to his place where he ought to be in one fashion or another, they're going to have something to eat? There was a thing that came through Ireland called a potato famine. And they left their country finding somewhere to eat. And then of course they came into America and by coming in here, they had somewhere to eat. But that's not the norm, you see. If you go to Ireland today, there's plenty to eat. I've been there. As a matter of fact, when you find most Christian countries, unless there is some specific reason, they've got plenty to eat. God's blessed you, he feeds you. And that's a good reason to check into the religion of the people who have rejected him and denied him. Folks, I know tonight it's hard for us to realize how bad it is. I spent 15 months in Okinawa, and it's just a word to a lot of people, but I was there. And I, let me tell you something, too. I was there about 20 years after World War II. I was there in 64. 45, the war ended. So I was there in, in, in about, about 20 years later. And that time, 20 years after World War II, Okinawa was a hard place to live in. Who's their god? Shintoism. They worship their, their ancestors. They have shrines all over the place. Is it still like that preacher? Oh yes, yes it is. And so he gave them food, he fed them. So do men reject Christ because of his humanitarianism? 
The Christian, the Christian, the Christian world has given much. It helps. It's our faith to, when we see someone suffer, to help them, to do something, to show the love of Christ to people. We do that. A lot of times by showing the love of Christ, the door is open where you can show them Christ and you can preach the truth to them and tell them about the Lord. Amen. In the book of Luke chapter number seven and verse number 47, do they reject Christ because he forgives sin? Luke chapter seven, verse 47. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Have your sins been forgiven? Mine have been forgiven. Thank God for the forgiveness of sins. Do you understand what religion will do for you though? It'll heap a load on your back. There are people that crawl, folks, on their hands and knees, climb hills and climb steps just to do some kind of an act of penance and think that by doing that, that they can earn repentance. They can earn forgiveness from God. You don't earn forgiveness. So how are you forgiven, preacher? You look to the forgiver. <laughs> That's what you do. You call upon him, you seek him and ask him to forgive you. The Bible said he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. And I'm when I say blessed, I mean happy, joyful, rejoices because his sins are forgiven. Can you imagine coming to the house of God and singing and worshiping the Lord with a load of baggage on you that you can't get off? and your soul eaten up with guilt, and you know that one day that you'll have to give an account for all those sins. The Bible says plainly that we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and all of us, every one of us will, but it won't be for sins. It'll be for works. It'll be for what you've done to serve the Savior. So he does forgive sins. I'll tell you right now, there's a lot of people tonight that wish their sins were forgiven. Oh, how they wish they were forgiven. They'd pay large sums of money. There are millionaires out there right now that would give you $100,000 in a heartbeat if they can get peace in their soul and have their sins forgiven. But you can't buy it, it's free. In the book of Luke chapter 23, verse 33, and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the male factors, one on the right hand, the other on the left. And then look at his character in verse number 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let me give you just a little bit of what I've learned in years studying. If you want to know what the Jewish people believe, find Jews that have been saved. Jews for Jesus. You'll find them on the internet. Say, so why is that important? Because they know their culture. They know their Talmud. They know what it teaches and they know what they taught. They were taught. They can open up that to you like you wouldn't believe. Just a little while ago, I was watching a thing, doing some research into some of this. And I went to a site, Jews for one of them. I'm not necessarily if it's Jews for Jesus, but it was a Jews that had been saved. And you know what they did? They've got a video posted on that site of a girl mocking the crucifixion of Christ. They've got a monkey and that monkey is conversing with her of this and that and this and that and this and that. And you can tell that it is viciously anti-Christ. And then to finish it off, she takes the monkey and she nails him to a cross. I thought to myself, you know, you got a problem. Even if you don't agree with their faith, you got a problem when you're mocking a death like that. What they're doing is they're opening a door and making themselves vulnerable for somebody to think, why would you do that? Why do they hate him so much? Why do they despise the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you realize, folks, not all Jews now. Somebody said, well, what do the Jews believe? Which ones? Judaism's a big tent. Oh, yes, it's a big tent. But I'll tell you right now, this group, they had a hatred for Christ like you wouldn't believe. That's satanic. Anybody that hates the Lord Jesus Christ who came and gave himself and nailed him to a cross and mock that. I thought, I'll tell you, I've seen a lot of stuff in my few years on this earth. And when I got through watching that thing, I was upset. It shook me to watch this girl, and she was half naked, to watch her get up there and mock our Lord Jesus Christ and then nail that monkey to a cross. My, my, my. I want you to turn to the book of John chapter 14. So do men reject the Lord Jesus Christ because he was nailed on a tree? Maybe they reject him for this. John chapter number 14 and verse number six. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's an absolute statement. That's a powerful statement. I mean, that's a statement. <laughs> that means I don't care what, you, what your religion is, where you live, where you came from, what you know. No, my, no man goes to the Father but by me. That's what the book says. 
Now I can understand why when people read this, they would hate Christ because it goes against their religion. If you've got a religion that denigrates the Lord Jesus, I can understand when you read that, how you could hate him for it. Because the statement he makes is absolute. It's absolute, he said, I am the way and the truth. But you know what? You're getting mighty close right now. You're getting very close to the greatest reason that men hate Christ. Self-righteousness is born in the soul and eats to the very nature of man. I'm as good as the next fellow. That's what they argue. And the truth of the matter is they are. The Bible said comparing themselves with themselves are not wise. Sure, I'm as good as the next Joe down the road, but neither one of us are gonna go to heaven on our righteousness. Whether I'm as good, worse, better, or whatever, it's not making a difference. There's only one righteousness that God will ever accept, and that's the righteousness of his son. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's one of the first verses I memorized when I got saved. I was talking to a young man this morning from Louisville, Kentucky. And I love talking to people that haven't been saved long. I love talking to people that haven't been raised in church. They haven't been raised in church. They don't know all the Christian cliches. They don't know any of this stuff. They're just fresh. He said, you know what? He said, I picked up the Bible. And he said, I started reading the Bible. And he said, the Bible's something else. He said, but I hadn't read it too long before it started speaking to me. I thought, oh, yes. He said, it started speaking to me. He didn't know where that came from. He didn't hear that in church. This is his experience. And then he wound up getting saved, and then God called him to preach, and now he's up preaching the Word of God. Something there, that's fresh. I, I love that. I, I, lo I love the testimony. You know, the problem is that we have our kids, we want to raise them right. Lord have mercy, you know that. We want to teach them. We want them to know the Lord. We want, to, we want all these things. But folks, kids aren't stupid. They learn how to act, how to talk, how to walk, how to, how to fool you. And they even brag about it. How many of you ever heard brag about it? Oh yeah, they know it, they know the ropes, they know all about it. But the thing is, I also love to hear when they say, you know, I finally got saved. And I've heard a lot of them say that. I finally came back to the Lord and I was born again. So who is he? Who is this Galilean that lived 2,000 years ago? Did he really live? Certainly he did, there's no question about that. Who was this man? Liberal Christianity says he's a good man but he was misunderstood, misinformed. He didn't know what he was doing. They don't believe in the virgin birth. They don't believe in the miracles of Christ. They don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in any of that. Yet they want to call themselves Christians. Why would you do that? Why would you call yourself a father of a man who is crazy? The Jews said, never a man spake like this man. They also said, what manner of man is this? That even the elements obey what he says. I'll tell you what manner of man he is. He's not a man like you've ever seen. Liberal Christianity is not Christianity in any shape or form. So what is academia then? What are, the, what are they teaching the universities? I've got a set of books in my office called the Encyclopedia Britannica, 1967. I cannot, for, I cannot remember how far back when I was old enough to know anything, I wanted an Encyclopedia Britannica, as far back as I can remember. And about 40 something years ago here at Temple Baptist Church, a man gave me that set. Sure did, Tiny C, 1967, there they are. Encyclopedia Britannica. But do you know what? In all that I've got in that in there, that's not the absolute truth. I can't go to that to find out the real truth. All I can get from that is man's perspective. That's academia. And there's nothing really wrong in the sense of academia. When you go to the doctor the next time, appreciate the fact he knows what he's doing. You don't want some guy on the job training to be operating on you, do you? So where do I get the truth of who he is? I don't get it from them. Now listen carefully to what I'm about to say to you. Muhammad died in 632 AD. Islam, the two great branches of it is Shiite and Sunni. Sunni's the larger branch. They're both looking for the return of a Mahdi, some kind of Messiah. They're looking for him to come back. You talk to one of them, they'll say, oh, we believe Jesus. Oh, yes, and Mary, oh, yes, Jesus was a great prophet. And Mary, of course, was his mother. And we believe in the prophets. We believe that the last and the greatest of the prophets, though, was Muhammad. They'll tell you that. But they say, we believe Jesus is coming again. We believe he's going to come again. And he's going to come with a Mahdi. And when he comes with the Mahdi, he's going to come to do away with Adajah, the Antichrist. And when they say Antichrist, they're saying anti-Messiah. You have to understand words. When people use a word, what do they mean by that word? What is a Messiah? Mashiach, he's an anointed one. Oh, they believe he's God. No, there's nowhere in the Bible, folks, that says the Messiah has to be God. You understand that? That's just get that little point right there. The Messiah doesn't, when they believed he was the Messiah, they didn't necessarily believe he was God because the Jews to this day, right now, are looking for their Messiah. But if you ask them if they believe he's the son of God or if he's God, no, he's the deliverer. He's the one who's gonna come and set us free. 
But of course, the Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 16, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Moses, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? Peter said, Thou art the Christ, Messiah. You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You see how he qualified it? You're the Son of God, he said. So why is that important? Because Jesus and the Mahdi together are going to destroy the Antichrist. And Jesus then is going to preach that the cross is wrong and that the doctrine of the preaching of the cross is wrong and that Islam is the true faith and he's going to tear down the cross and he's going to point men and women on this earth to Islam and it's going to bring in an age of peace upon the earth. Now let's put it together. The Jews are looking for the Mashiach, the Messiah. Islam is looking for the Messiah and Jesus and they're all supposed to be coming back at the end times. Where are we at? According to them, we're in the end times. According to most preaching, we're in the end times. I believe we're close. I don't I, you know, I have no way of knowing anything except what the Bible says. I know this. I know you live in a great apostasy. I know the love of many shall wax cold. I know that. I know Christianity in this country is just about dead, twice dead and plucked up by the roots. Leastwise professing Christianity. Do I believe the Lord's coming back? Oh, I don't question he's coming back. When's he coming back? He said, if I go, I'll come again to receive you into myself. So what are we looking for? Are we not possibly looking for an Islamic antichrist? Are we possibly looking into Islam for the antichrist? You ever wondered how that fits in, how that party fits in? Islam has retained their identity better than anybody on this earth. You let the Muslims kill thousands of people and the president will gather together a bunch of Muslims and a bunch of everything else. They'll sit down at a big long table and he'll go out of his way to let you understand that the Muslims are peaceful people. How many remember that? Peaceful people. And nothing personal against Mr. Bush, but he doesn't know one end from the other when it comes to what a Muslim is or anything about this. He has no idea whatsoever. If you know anything about Islam, you'll know that they conquered by the sword and that they took North Africa and they even moved across into Spain and they were the Moors and had the, had the, had the uh, Catholics not stopped them in 1683 at the Battle of Vienna, they would have come on into Europe. And uh, guess what kind of shape you'd be in today had they done that? What do you mean? It took battle. It took bloodshed. It took war to stop them from literally overrunning the United States or overrunning Western Europe. And they did stop them, thank God. Nothing personal, but they stopped them. So we have a religion that is based upon a book that commands them to kill the infidel and to take this world for Allah. So we'll see what happens. An antichrist is gonna come and he may very well come through Islam. I'll say this about it and then I'll shut up about Islam. They are far, far, far more dedicated to what they believe than 99% of the Christians that I know. How do you know that? In Islam, the only way that you can be guaranteed that you're going to go to heaven, to be guaranteed is to die a martyr. And they died as martyrs. Shaheed, they call it. So yes, yes, Islam and their prophet. Hinduism, a Jew in the Crimea in the 1800s, his name was Notovich, and I've mentioned him to you before. He said that Christ went into uh, into into India and studied under Buddhist and Hindus and they taught him how to perform miracles, conjure up spirits and so forth and so on. And so everything that he did when he went back into Galilee, he got it from the Hindu and from the Buddhist. People believe that today. They believe that Hinduism, Buddhism, which is brother and sister, they believe that that is the true revelation understanding of God, their definition of who God is. Sad thing is that most Christians would have a new idea how to respond to that kind of talk, but that's what they believe. Then you have witchcraft, magic. You talk to a witch, that's the craft they call it. Keep in mind the craft. You talk to a witch, and witches are all over the internet. If you don't hear what they have to say, they'll be glad to log on to their website. They'll be glad to tell you what they believe. Do they believe Jesus Christ? Oh yes, absolutely. They don't believe him as the savior. He was a worker of miracles. He was magic, he was a magician. There is a thing called a philosopher's stone. The philosopher's stone is some kind of an essence or some kind of a thing that holds the secret of how to turn any metal into gold. But it goes further than simply gold. It also has with it this added benefit of eternal life, living forever. 
That therefore became the basis of alchemy. And so there are those out there right now who are trying to find the secret of eternal life. Let me tell you what the secret of eternal life is. It's a person, but that's what they believe. And then of course, Judaism, as I told you a moment ago, do your own research in this and it'll help you greatly. Go to Jews that have been saved and read what they have to say. They can read their Hebrew, they know their Talmud, they know the secrets, they know the buzzwords, they know the code words. Listen to what they have to say and you'll be amazed it comes out from it. So then that leaves one, Bible-believing Christian. What do I believe about this man? I believe he's God Almighty walking in flesh. If you've seen him, you've seen God. What's the Father look like? You don't have a clue, and I don't either. His Father's a spirit, but I know he manifested himself in the Son. And the Lord Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How do I understand that? It's a mystery, but it's the Godhead. The Bible said, in him dwelleth the Godhead fully, fully, bodily, fully dwelt in him. The Lord Jesus Christ is God of very God. Amen. That's who he is. Not a God. We're not one of the little gods of the big God. Got some charismatics out there teaching that garbage tonight. Saying you're God. Listen, you cannot become God. That cannot happen. It cannot happen. You cannot become God. God Almighty is the essence of himself and there's not another like him. And he has existed from everlasting to everlasting. I can't explain, I can't understand the essence of God because he's a spirit being. But he has always been. But what he will make of you is a son of God by the new birth. I'm glad for that, amen. I am so glad for that tonight. He was virgin born. He came to this world. A father was not a man. His father was God. When the Lord Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem of Judea, he was born when God incarnated himself into a man. Satan is gonna do the same thing. He's gonna incarnate himself into a man. So how does he do that, preacher? Because Satan's a spirit being. He's a spirit and he'll incarnate himself into a man. And then when he incarnates himself, in other words, to incarnate means to become flesh. Spanish carne is flesh. Chili con carne, chili with flesh. Okay, so to incarnate oneself is to go into flesh, is to become flesh. And this is what Satan's gonna do. The Antichrist for three and one half years is gonna be a man just like you and me. Not one bit of difference. Born exactly like we are. But then the Bible said Satan will enter in him like he did Judas Iscariot and he incarnates himself in that man. He doesn't win. He has a deadly blow to the head. According to Revelation 13, he has a deadly blow to the head. From all indications, he dies. You say, how could Satan raise the dead? Remember this, folks. He that letteth will let till be taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit's going to be removed from his hindrance. And God Almighty is going to allow a lot of things to happen. And when he does allow these things to happen, it'll be for the glory of God. It'll be things happening that have never happened on this earth before. And he will come back to life. And when he does, he comes back as Satan incarnate. And for three and one half years, the Antichrist will be more than a man. He'll be the devil walking in flesh. That's gonna be something when that happens because there's an awful lot of candidates right now begging to be the Antichrist. They wanna be, they want, the, they want to be the Antichrist in every, every, every possible way. Can't imagine, but that's where we are. That's where we've gotten to in 20. We've gotten to the point where people are no longer reverent the spirit that I, when I was saved into the church, the spirit in the church in those days was reverence. They didn't have this, 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 this dead, rejecting type spirit that you get today. It wasn't like that then. People were believers then. Everything's changed. We're running out of time. It's about over. It's about finished. It's so sad because I believe the Antichrist is going to have a field day when it comes to the church. He's going to have an awful lot of people in the church house that just absolutely accept him and join up with him. He becomes their God, and they've rejected Christ, and the end is near. God help us tonight, folks. Don't let it happen to you. It's about over. There's not much time left. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved? if you're not willing to repent. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.